Malcolm Shaw. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so I guess this is, uh, as Turtle said, a uh, talk I gave at DDD last year. Uh, it's documentation for developers and friends. I'm just going to start my timer. Um, so I'll start with a little intro to myself. As was mentioned, I work at Six Pivot. I'm a consultant at this company, um, practice director, principal consultant, and a CTO of a startup as well, um, which is what's here. So what I'm going to talk mostly about today is the consulting side of things, but it's, it's kind of relevant to anyone, uh, any developers or, or friends or team members of developers. Uh, but consulting gives us a really good opportunity to see the same problems across a lot of clients uh, or a, a range of code bases and things like that. Um, so, I'm talking about documentation. Uh, why do we or why should we document things? Because I know we, we probably should, but we don't. Uh, one of the main reasons why we don't is that, uh, sorry, why should we? So one of the main things, reasons we should is to communicate complex ideas to people. Um, one of the things that we see as consultants coming into projects is we get these code bases that are maybe a year old if we're lucky or 10 years old and uh, there's no, there's nothing. You open up, you clone the Git repo if you're lucky or the subversion repo if you're not. Um, or unzip a file, who knows? Uh, and there's just a bunch of code. So uh, one of the like one of the big things I'm going to talk about here is how to simplify developer onboarding, uh, because that is a thing that we want to do. We suffer from a lot, um, and whether it's bringing new people into your team, um, or the other one that I love is, as I guess in my job, and also because I was doing side projects that I like I mentioned there. Um, you do something and then you're really busy doing six other things and you come back to it next week and it's like, how does this thing, like, how do these things talk to each other? So another de great reason for documentation is uh, future me needing to remember what I did last week, um, which I think we all can have experienced. Um, another couple of things that are really useful that, you know, I, I think code bases these days can sort of be self-documenting. The, the concept of uh, code comments to explain how things work is probably a thing of the past. Uh, but things like solution architecture and architectural guidance is a really good reason for documentation, um, which comes back again to the onboarding of new team members. If you can, um, if someone can quickly come in and look at a page or a, a diagram or something and kind of go, Oh yeah, I see the main, the six components of this system. It's a really, it gets them across it a lot quicker than delving into a code base or looking through a Word doc or something like that. Um, so then why, yeah, that's all the reasons that we should be documenting. Why aren't we doing it? Well, first of all, it's kind of boring. Whenever, I don't know, I'm surprised people turned up when I did a talk about documentation. Um, whenever it comes up on the, you know, on the backlog of a, a project, uh, documentation user story. I'm pretty sure that everyone avoids it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm getting my hair done that week or whatever. Uh, it's not super fun. Um, and there's plenty of really good excuses for not doing it. So get, it gets out of date. Like, oh, if I do that, then I'm going to have to update it every time I change the code, all of that. Um, the other one is that it, when you're in the flow of writing code or working in something technical, and then you have to go and document stuff, it breaks that flow. Um, and especially when it requires different tooling. So if you have to go from using um, Visual Studio or Rider or something like that and switch over to Visio or MS Paint or whatever you're using to do some diagramming or Word for documents, it is just kind of a cognitive load. Um, and then the other one is, which is probably not, what, not why we're not doing it, but you can't version control a lot of these documentation formats that exist at the moment. So um, or you, allegedly you can, like a Word document, but good luck reliably diffing two Word documents. Um, and if it's a Visio diagram, you've got no chance. Um, and then the other one is just getting started. Everybody's kind of too concerned about making it work, making it perfect. Uh, like, so we just don't, don't bother. Um, and and the, I guess this is some of the traditional approaches to documentation that I've already sort of touched on. Um, I used to have a really great 
diagram or a, a screenshot of a Word document that uh, was a classic old school like 1990s government sort of spec, um, but I, I don't know where it went. So anyway, so I took some screenshots of other things. And yeah, we use a combination of, of storage mediums for our documentation, wikis and things like Confluence, um, the classic Word documents and text files and other different things like that. Um, and then, so there's, I guess, documentation of, of words, and then there's documentation as diagrams, and we use things like Visio and MS Paint and um, Draw.io Draw and Miro, uh, a favorite of our team. Um, but the, yeah, those tools are very detached from the code base or the, the software that we're working on. Um, so, <clears throat> what's a possible, what's a solution to this? Uh, and it's, I'd like to propose this idea that's been working well for me. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few different tools and techniques that I've been using. Um, most of them are open source based and there's a bunch of alternatives. So, uh, don't shoot me for suggesting my chosen tools. Um, there definitely are other ones um, and it's really, use these tools, use whatever works for you um, if you're gonna do documentation over not doing it. So yeah, documentation as code. Uh, and the idea is if you're able to put your documentation in the repo alongside your code, there's a bunch of benefits. Um, if you think about it like code and treat it like code, uh, you can do versioning, you can create branches. Um, so then if you've got, if you do a code change or an architectural refactor of your code base, um, you can just update the documentation for that. And then it's in alignment with your code base. So if you go back and check out an old version of your code, the documentation is valid for that piece of code. You don't have to go and find which Word document is the right one. Um, and <clears throat> I like the idea of separating the presentation of the, this is more about diagrams, but I suppose documentation to some extent, separating the rendering and presentation of of the art output or the artifact from the creation of it. Um, and what I mean by that is in its simplest example, something like Markdown, raw Markdown is readable, it doesn't look very pretty, but it does the job. But then you can render it into a Word document or a PDF or a website or whatever you want. Um, you're focusing your effort on just writing the documentation and not the prettiness of it, um, <laughs> which is something that is one of the, the I guess, pushbacks that I get on this a lot of the time is, um, but if it was in Visio, I can draw the line exactly where I want it, which I'll try and do a demo of later on. You've got to let go of some of that. Um, and the other thing that I really want to achieve in, in this approach is to get rid of any tooling. So for, <clears throat> I guess for startups, so I guess in two parts of my life, when I'm working on startups and they don't want to, we don't want to spend money to buy a new tool, uh, a Visio license or a Word license or any license, um, what can I do that uses open source tools or the tools that we already have? Um, in corporates and enterprises, it's almost the same problem but on the other scale. It's so hard to get a purchase order for a $25 piece of software that it's just not going to happen. Or if there's licensing, um, requirements on using a particular tool. Uh, if you've got a team of 20 developers and everyone needs a license for Visio, like it adds up pretty quick. So can we do stuff that doesn't require licensing? Um, and then my last and favorite one is just like, let's just get started, be pragmatic and get something going and then improve on it over time. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I guess some pros and cons to this approach. I think I've kind of covered a few of these already on the pro side, um, that you can version control it. It's easy to use. It uses the tools that we already know. Um, for the most part, it's cross-platform, so it'll work on any machine or any device, um, any web platform to some extent. Uh, and the other things that I've already mentioned, minimal tooling and no licensing. On the con side, there's definitely a learning curve. I think. Most people can open up something like Word or Visio and not have to learn how to use it. It's quite intuitive. If you want to draw a box, you draw a box. If you want to write some words, you just type them in and pick the menu items off the bar for formatting and stuff. Um, if you're going to do some of the diagramming technologies that I'm going to talk about, you need to learn a, a DSL or a language that they'll use. But it's 
like there is a learning curve. I don't think it's too hard. You can copy and paste stuff off the internet um, or use chat GPT. That's probably the, the, the right answer to everything now. Um, it, it's less accessible for non-tech folks to do documentation as code. So if you think about <clears throat> Markdown, like Markdown's pretty straightforward to developers and it's not super hard, but it's not as easy as using Word. And then if we version control those things and expect our non-tech friends to jump in and start using, doing pull requests and things like that, there is a, a barrier to that and there's friction. Um, it depends, I guess, on whether you want the rest, like those people to be contributing to your documentation or just consuming it. If it's just consuming it, um, I have solutions to that. Um, but then there are tools like Gitbook, um, similar stuff to that where it's a web-based interface that kind of abstracts and hides some of this, uh, the editing and the workflows. So there are options there too. Um, sometimes it's harder to search this stuff uh, and aggregate it, but uh, there are solutions to that depending on the scale of your code bases and the scale of your organization. Um, and then code sprawl is something that came up after I gave this talk at DDD. If, because my, my proposed solution is if you've got a bunch of repos, you should put the documentation for that code base in the code base alongside your code. Um, so now I have 20 readmes or 20 documentation repositories. Um, so how do I know where to look for things if I don't know which <coughs> repo to look in and all this sort of thing. So that's a downside but I feel like it's a downside that is minor because at least you've got documentation now. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of a story around uh, an average consulting story or a project that we might roll in on. Um, so it could be a new project um, or a new client probably. Uh, so maybe we, we go to a new client to help them deliver some, you know, add some new features to something or fix up some you know, issues that they're having on their repo or their code base. Um, there's, I'm gonna say there's a handful of repositories. So maybe there's a web project and a mobile app and a couple of other things. Cause I, this is, I suppose, what can make some of this hard where you've got more than one code base. Um, and of course there's no documentation uh, of any type. <laughs> uh, and so it's like, yeah, we, we just need to add some features to this code base, but where do we start? Um, so I think, probably everyone has used GitHub or Azure DevOps. Um, so the first thing that we might wanna do is understand the repo or the code base that I'm looking at right now. So for each of those repos, um, someone, if someone new is coming into this code base, what can they do? Like, how can we make it easier for them to understand what this thing contains? Like the repo could be, if you're lucky, called, um, I don't know, corporate-web app or corporate-iOS app, and you're like, okay, I, I know what this is, but it could also be a project name, like Project Athena, uh, which people love to do. It's like, okay, well, what the heck's this project? Um, so most, almost everyone's seen a README. Um, some, I, I've seen you know, a range of good quality and not so good quality ones from uh, the, the basic GitHub template that's got the project name and then insert your stuff here, uh, through to really comprehensive ones. So the things that um, I like to see in here, I think I have a screenshot of this later. And anyway, I'll talk about it now, um, is what's, the pro like, what's in the code base? What are the dependencies? Um, what are the technologies used, if that's relevant? Uh, how do I get started? So as a new developer in here, do I need to install any things on my machine? Um, and Ideally, like, can I just go NPM run or do I load in Visual Studio and hit F5? So what's the, yeah, the minimum steps I need to get going. <coughs> uh, if it's, if you're in a larger organization, you can start adding more rich information, like who's in charge of this repo, who do I talk to if I need help, uh, and things like that. Um, if, you're, if you've got multiple code bases, it's good to use a template so there's a consistent approach to this um, so that People know what to put in there for one, and also when you're scouring through your GitHub organization, you can find that it, you can see quickly where you need to look for things. Um, I'd say I was previously using this README MD generator, which is a, I think it's an NPM 
uh, package that you just run and it create, like asks you a bunch of questions and then creates the file for you. Um, or Google for answers would have been what I said last time, but now I was playing around the other day and it's really just uh, chat GPT. What's a good template to use for a markdown readme in a repo um, for technology? And it came up with all of the headlines that I just said. So yeah, definitely cheat and use chat GPT for these things. Um, <clears throat> and then, so then, yeah, so the next thing, sorry, that's readme's. Uh, so once we've got a couple of repos, um, we've identified the simplistic thing of what's in there. So we've, now this is a, a React project. It uses um, yarn, yarn start, whatever it might be. I know how to get started. I know how to run the project. Uh, but that's, that's interesting. Why did they choose to use Bootstrap or why did they choose to use something else? Like there's, there's decisions have been made in this code base. And uh, one thing that I find we have a lot of conversations around in different clients and, and internally is uh, revisiting decisions that have been made in the past. And it's such a frustrating waste of time. Some, like it's good to question things, but sometimes you don't want to have that conversation every time a new team member joins the, the team. Um, so tracking decisions, so and I don't know, that blue might not be great, but markdown decision records or uh, ADRs, um, architecture decision records, but they, they're really just decision um, records of things. So when you make a big decision in a project to use something like, um, like a, a web framework or introduce a new package to your, um, your .NET project or something that is a sort of uh, cross the board big change, and especially when you've had an argument about it, it's good to track that in this sort of approach. And again, these are just markdown files, create a folder uh, called docs or ADRs or something like that, and just create a file for each decision that's made on the project. Um, again, there's a template, well, Google uh, or ChatGPT for the template, um, but it's things like, what problem are we solving? What are some of the things we talked about using? And what's the decision we made? <clears throat> um, and potentially any side effect or consequences of that decision that may be realized in the future. Um, I find this is a really good one. Uh, there was one particular project I was on where the team wanted to use Angular because they had the skills in that area and everyone else around that team in the organization was using different technologies and they kind of wanted them to standardize on React, but they the team wanted to use Angular and they did a pretty good pitch of why they should because they didn't have to learn and they could get going quicker. Um, so they captured that in a decision record so that when the next person came along and criticized them for not standardizing, they could have a little bit of history of why that conversation happened um, and, and that it was sort of discussed and here's the pros and cons and, and all of that. So that, that was a good outcome, I guess. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a screenshot of uh, some decision records that were on a project. So um, some of those were technical decisions around, you know, should we build this as a single page app or should it be a server rendered sort of style app? Um, a self-referential one that we should use markdown records to track decisions um, and a few other technical choices and architectural choices. So yeah, they build up over time. And then um, oh, this is an example of that one around uh, the use of Angular um, with some of the bullet points. So yeah, what, what are the problems we're solving? What were some of the decisions that were made and, and options that were considered? Um, and I'm happy to share these slides after. So I won't, uh, I'll skip over some of this a little bit. Um, so yeah, I guess once we've started to capture, this is probably more when you're, when you're looking at an existing code base or adding new things to a code base. Um, then the next part of that is across, so that was on individual code bases maybe. Um, now we've got say five or six that have got dependencies between each other. Um, so this is where I would say we need to start documenting some architectural guidance, uh, sort of principles. Um, and that's things like, how do these things talk to each other? So let's say it's a microservices um, architecture and we wanna say we're going to use um, HTTP calls between things or we're not going to do that. So that you can have a principle that sort of says, 
when integrating between services, always use a service bus or things like that at that sort of level. So it's not super prescriptive, but, but it could be. Um, but it gives people an option so when they're coming into a code base, they don't need to, depending on the organization, go to the architect to get a tick to make a decision on a code level decision. Um, so, and this has saved us on so many projects, again, of stopping, stopping the arguments, of circular arguments about decisions. Um, or when new people come in, they can kind of go through this thing and they can get up to speed a lot quicker and not have to talk to the broader team to make decisions that have been sort of, uh, that have principles attached to them at a high level. So <clears throat> as an example, uh, so these examples here were from a sort of industrial computing project that we've been working on, um, where there was machinery and PLCs and hardware and robots and all sorts of cool stuff going on. Um, and so, uh, the hardware in this instance, or the, the machines were PCs, but they were low spec PCs. And so one of the principles around um, for this project was to minimize the number of dependencies of services and stuff that needed to go on those machines because they're low spec and they can't handle uh, running stuff. And so um, a really concrete example of that was that someone wanted to put um, MQTT brokers uh, or service brokers on each of the devices out in the field and have them do their own MQTT um, but for many reasons but resources was one of them that was decided to be a bad idea and they were instead going to use a centralized MQTT broker um, so that went in as a principle it's like we've made this decision uh, whenever you're making dis other decisions that are similar to this if you look at the principles hopefully they can guide you um, to, to not have to talk to the architect or the, whoever it might be about that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I guess it is really, like for me, these are really about empowering the development teams, especially in organizations where there's uh, architects um, or tech leads or different levels of, I guess, technical leadership. Um, so that the devs teams can move as fast as they can or as fast as possible without having to involve too many other people on every small decision. Um, all right, so now into the fun stuff. So um, because of time today, I'm going to kind of go through, I guess, the theory and some screenshots of this stuff. And then depending on how we go for time at the end, I'll give an interactive demo of this. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, so that's the approach I'm going to take. Um, so diagramming, uh, I love this thing called plant UML. Uh, it's a text-based markup language um, that lets you, it's called plant UML. It lets you do UML diagrams, but it also lets you do like 60 other different types of diagrams. Um, and so the ones I use every day are, I guess, UML diagrams, entity relationship diagrams, um, C4 diagrams, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and sequence diagrams, if I didn't mention that already. Um, but you can also extend it with other uh, charting symbols. So if you want to do AWS or Azure or Kubernetes diagrams of deployments, um, it's really easy. You can have the pretty icons in there as well. Uh, as far as tooling goes, back to my point earlier about I hate paying for licenses, it works, it's, it's just text, I guess, uh, and then a renderer that's a Java whatever jar file, um, but can also run as a web server. Um, so to write plant UML, you need VS Code, Vim, anything that writes text. Uh, if you use an IDE though, you can get um, inline live rendering. So that's kind of nice. So you can edit and see the changes instantly. <coughs> um, so this is an example of a sequence diagram in plant UML. Uh, that's how it renders. Um, so yeah, these are different. I, I'm going to kind of skip through these a bit and then show what they look like in reality. And, and I'll build them up um, step by step so you can see the, the live rendering. But this, yeah, a sequence diagram. Um, again, on that project that I mentioned, the industrial um, computing project, uh, there were different teams. There were the machine teams, the PLC teams that were writing the in actual controllers. Um, there was a server team and then there were 
was our team that was building this in, in between piece of interface software. Um, but until a certain point, uh, no one had been diagramming anything. They'd been talking about trying to communicate these sorts of things um, in confluence, in tables of like, it should do this, and then it should do this thing, and this other thing. Um, and so one day when I was down there during a testing sequence, sort of testing flow, um, we started to build these out because we built, we started to do stuff on the whiteboard and then the, the amount of rub outs and changes became unmanageable. So we started doing it uh, in plant UML. Um, and now, thankfully, this is built into the culture of that organization. And so now they're using sequence diagrams as the starting point for building software instead of the, um, the debugging point after things fall apart. So that's a huge win. Um, so yeah, entity relationship diagram, it's just as you would have seen in every ERD ever, but you can define these in plant UML. Uh, they're quite straightforward. Um, oh, I'm gonna embarrass Gert here. So this is, a, this is a live screenshot of a Teams call where we were live editing Plant UML the other day. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a, a snippet of the Plant UML. It's kind of squished up to the side, but I'll do a proper demo of that in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is like, I love this so much and I'm trying to influence the rest of my team to use it more. Um, and so this was a new project we'd st we were just starting a couple of weeks ago and uh, I saw this opportunity while we were on the call. I'm like, oh, we're doing live plant UML editing. Um, and that was actually quite cool. I mean, you could do it with MS Paint as well, but the idea of being able to, um, on a call with one person, like mob programming, I guess, uh, of a diagram, and you could just see uh, edit him editing the text and it rendering to the right-hand side. And we were spending time talking about the structures of the entities and the fields that needed to be in there. And we were spending zero time watching someone drag boxes around and try to get lines lined up and all of that stuff that's just kind of noise. So <clears throat> I'll get back to, the, to a demo at the end. Um, as I mentioned briefly, the next evolution of uh, the CIF, uh, of the plant UML, or not really an evolution, another way of diagramming that you can use plant UML for is the C4 model. So if anyone's been to Yao in the last few years, this guy, Simon Brown, talks about C4 all the time. He created it um, and it's a really good way to use a few simple abstractions um, to communicate software or system concepts in a, in a nice, in a very visual way. Um, and the, the reason for the abstractions is almost to oversimplify things so that you spend more time talking about the boxes and things um, than which type of diagramming item you should have used. Uh, the reason it's called C4 is because there are four levels of diagram. So there's the, the top level one, which is the context, which is kind of almost, here's my business, and uh, we have a website, and we have an app, and we have uh, an ERP, and, and maybe that's it, or a banking app. Um, it's very high level. It shows uh, the scope of systems and the users at a sort of enterprise-y sort of level. Um, down from that, then you would break the container level, you break things down, into you know, what's inside that. So if I've got a, a banking system, uh, it might have a couple of backend services or a database or a user authentication service. So you break it down a little bit more. Um, honestly, those two levels are almost as far as I ever go in the C4 model. Um, but component level is, is the next level down and that's breaking up uh, what's, in, like what's in one of those systems. So the backends, what would be an example, like a web app might actually, or web system might actually have, then you break it down into the API and the database and, and things like that. Um, code level, I've never really bothered to go that far, but if you had a really complex system, you might wanna do a class map of how things fit together. Um, and then deployment uh, is kind of, it's like C4 plus a couple of extra bonus ones. Um, I've found the deployment diagram really useful to be able to explain how systems are deployed. So that's more like your cloud, uh, cloud architecture. Um, and so that's another sort of add-on there. 
Um, again, this is so C4, if you Google it, you'll find the C4 model, um, but I'll share the slides. I've got links to the main website and a few other really good resources for that. Um, there's also a book on the topic that is worth a read. Um, and, well, and also Simon Brown's umpteen uh, YouTube videos. Uh, and so this is an example of a C4 diagram. This is a bad example of a C4 diagram that I created for a very simple app. Um, and this is that, uh, like what I was saying at the enterprise level. So we have all these different types of users. Um, there's some backend systems and it's using some S3 for storage and stuff. And uh, if you're building C4 diagrams and you can't figure out why the lines are crossing or you're, there's too many lines, it's probably because you've tried to put too much stuff on the, on the top level diagram, which when I showed this to someone, they were like, I kind of like this documentation as code, but it just looks messy. And then I thought, hmm. So I went back and I'll show this in the demo, but I went back and actually this is all it is. These are the two users that use the system and there's three things that they interact with. And that, that level, that's, that's good enough. Um, that's at the context level. And then, uh, then you would break down those things. And so you'd maybe just have that part of the diagram in the middle would now be your next level down diagram, your component diagram. Um, but I'll demo that. Um, and so, yeah, this is uh, a different example of the, the same diagramming type. So, you, yeah, breaking things down into different components, different systems, um, but at a high level. And so it's, it's really a way to communicate um, complex system concepts to a wider audience. And I've used these for communicating <laughs> architectures to everyone from developers who are joining a project through to executives in massive companies who um, embarrassingly said that it was the best architecture diagram they'd ever seen because it was so simple. Uh, and I'm, whereas I'm thinking, I can't believe I'm showing this to an executive because it's like messy and clunky, but uh, it only had five or six boxes and for them that was what they cared about. So um, bringing it all together, let me just check how I am for time. Okay. Um, so I've kind of shared a bunch of bits and pieces of different thing. It's sort of an evolution uh, of coming from no documentation and building up a bit of uh, and, uh, maturity and capability in your documentation powers. Um, but what about if you've got five or 5,000 repos or you want to be able to create documentation in different formats? Um, there's a heap of options. Uh, I guess as developers, we probably know the answer to some of this and it's, it's using um, like GitHub Actions or CI automation. So whenever you check it in, it runs a script um, and there's a, there's a heap of stuff out on, on the internet for open source options for this to convert things like Markdown and plant UML into PDFs or Word documents or whatever you need. Um, there was a thing called C4 Builder that I was a fan of, uh, but now, because what it would do was take, um, go back a little bit. So yeah, if you've got a, mark, a single markdown page, this is great. If, you want, if you've got a folder of them, like more and more documentation, you start to document um, different areas of your system or developer usage documentation, things like that, you might end up with a folder of markdown files. Um, so C4 Builder was a really good way to Yeah, so Mermaid is another option. Um, I started with Plant UML. Uh, that's the way I've always done it. And <laughs> um, I found Plant UML first. Uh, and so that was one reason. Um, I think Mermaid, there were some documentation, uh, sorry, diagram types that Mermaid didn't have um, previously that it does have now. It's got C4, but it's in like, sort of beta or sort of trial. So that's, that's one reason, but it's, it's my reason. Um, I'd say if you don't care about C4 or whatever, Mermaid's awesome because it also runs in the browser, like you can run it in the browser. It's supported by a heap of wikis natively. You don't need to pre-process it elsewhere. So it has got 
pros in that respect. Um, whatever works for you. Yeah, um, but uh, like probably the main one is because I stumbled over plant UML before I stumbled over mermaid. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. If you've got a, a, a folder full of uh, markdown files or um, or different documentation files, yeah, there are there are a few tools that will do things like pull them together into a single PDF or pull them into a document structure of some sort. Um, but uh, I was saying use C4 Builder before. Now, I, like literally two weeks after I, or three weeks after I gave this talk at DDD last year, I found MakeDocs. Um, and MakeDocs is the, it's a Python tool. Um, there are heaps of other options. There's ones that render it using React or Vue. But basically, find a tool that takes markdown folders and creates a static website out of them. And MakeDocs, is, does, MakeDocs does that. Um, that's a really boring screenshot of it on the, on the side there. Uh, but you would have seen websites that look kind of like that thing at the top, uh, and that's often these static site generators. Um, so that's if you've got uh, a repo with a few documents, or if you've got a few repos with a few documents, um, you can also use MakeDocs with a plugin, um, and it can clone, you can clone all of your repos down into like a mono repo sort of structure, and it will find all of the docs and build a uh, a docs of docs sort of tree. Um, so that's pretty cool. But then if you're in a bigger organization and you've got more stuff than that, uh, more than a few repos, or if you want uh, a richer experience or other features, there's this thing called Backstage um, that I'm not gonna demo, but it's worth Googling. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, it's a developer, yeah, you've used it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a developer documentation port or developer portal, portal, not just documentation. So yeah, so it does API, Swagger documentation. Um, you can use it to provision Kubernetes clusters and all sorts of stuff, um, but you can also use it just as a, like a smart documentation stack. So it's got this thing called Tech Docs, um, and it's based again on Markdown, and it'll pull all of that stuff in, make it searchable, and, um, and it works really, like there's a bit of setup because it's a big project. Yeah. Um, it's got a good plugin as well, so if you've got projects with Swagger in them and just point your repos at it, then it just injects and <coughs> makes, makes stacks in there. Yeah, it seems, so yeah, so it's pretty, pretty powerful um, if you want to set up a developer portal for your company. Um, I had a look at it, and I think if you were setting it up for a team of 10 developers, it's probably overkill, but if you've got 10 teams of 10 developers, maybe it's worth having a look at. Um, or if, yeah, if you've got spare time on the weekend and you just want to play with a cool thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is MakeDocs, uh, a screenshot of MakeDocs. This is MakeDocs with Material UI, so it looks prettier. Uh, this one kind of looks like the websites I used to build when I started as a developer. Uh, and this looks more like the websites I wish I could build. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's loads of plugins for this. Uh, it can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, right, so let's just skip ahead. So now, um, so if anyone wants to ask questions while I fiddle around and get my demo set up, feel free. Otherwise, I will start demoing. So yeah, what, I'm, what I'll do here is just a quick example of some of the stuff I spoke about in the previous slides. So this one here, is that? Is that big enough for everyone at the back? Or a bit bigger? Bit bigger? All right. I'm gonna have to stand back myself. <laughs> All good. So yeah, so I've just I've kind of started one, uh, but commented it out so you can see as things build up. So um, the stuff at the top's more like metadata that says how things are structured. Um, so one thing that I'll say with plant UML is that to one of my earliest points, they it's more about focusing on the content of what you're trying to communicate than the presentation of what you're trying to communicate. Um, <clears throat> and there's a little bit of a, a, like a Zen journey message here, because if you try to format these diagrams, you will drive yourself insane because it's not designed that way. 
Um, so as soon as you can let go of the need to, to align things properly, then you'll be happy. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's quite funny. Um, I, yo. Uh, sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, the question was, um, how, do the, how do the teams feel when you have diagrams and not everything's nicely aligned? Um, yeah, def like it's definitely a thing that comes up. Almost everyone, I show them this and they're like, oh, that's so cool. And then they start it and they're like, you can't line things up. And every time you change things, they move around, like it auto routes or auto layouts. Um, people comment on it and then they kind of get over it. They do. Yeah, yeah. It's better than no diagram. It's better than no diagram, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. At least the mermaid, you can add CSS to it. <laughs> yeah, you can, like, you can add design, CS, like CSS and stuff to this, but you can't add, you can, and you can add layout hints, but it may or may not listen. Like, yeah. I think it comes down to the fact that you should not add too much of code in one document either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you minimize the amount of, content in the one document, then that <laughs> becomes less of a concern, um, definitely. So yeah, so here's a starting point. Um, I'm just going to start adding stuff to this um, as I quickly type. So you can see just by adding those two lines, it's added the, the sequence. Um, this line here, kind of obvious, but adds numbering, which is handy. So that was a, like, that's a nice little feature when you're communicating with other teams on that sort of diagram, you can be like, yeah, I think sequence number 15 is wrong. Um, I'm just gonna comment, uncomment a whole bunch there. So yeah, as you build it out, you can do things like these, add little notes above them, um, change the color. Like, and I, I feel like when we're putting weird tags around things to change colors, maybe that's going a bit towards the presentation, but in this case, it was really helpful to communicate uh, a message clearly that the things that are in blue um, that means something. I don't remember now what it is, but yeah, the things that are in blue were relevant to a particular part of the system. The things that were in, in orange were relevant to another part. Um, and then, uh, like I'm not hoping to make this into a comprehensive demo of all the syntax, but I'll just quickly show you some of the features, I guess. So you can do things like grouping. Um, grouping, comments, and conveying a nice message in a picture. <laughs> so, so that's a sequence diagram. Um, here it goes for an entity relationship diagram. Uh, I'm not going to build this one out because it's. I think we've all seen one of these before. Um, well, and it's going to be tiny anyway. Yeah. So you can do this, uh, and this is this is sort of not the exact example, but what we were doing on that call the other day. Um, I don't know, I might do something like this, add a new field, where will it go? It appeared down the bottom. Uh, but if I added a new, uh, new entity, who knows where that's going to appear and what's going to happen to my whole document. Um, where did it even go? Oh, it's off the side. Uh, but you can kind of see every time I hit save that that's re-rendering and it's I mean, it's not such a complex example that it's going all over the place, but sometimes you'll add a new element and it'll just kind of whoop, flip the whole thing and things at, at the bottom that were at the top. Um, it's something to be aware of, but I don't think it's a reason not to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, and that's actually something else is that the IDEs have autocomplete for a lot of these things now, so that helps. Um, so yeah, this is back to that uh, that bad example that I gave, which has too much stuff on the screen. Um, I tried to encompass everything, marketing websites and online stores and all sorts of stuff um, that were sort of, it's kind of interesting to give a whole overall uh, architectural view, but it's too much for what we really needed, which was this. Uh, is my, there we go. Um, which is just the key, like the core systems of this, or the core components of this solution. Um, 
and then yeah more more c4 diagrams i there's a bunch of examples of these on the internet uh but i and i won't go into it too much because i don't know if anyone wants to see me type stuff um and it's also not split screen properly nah but yeah these like these are c4 the c4 diagrams uh and then this one is another diagram type called an activity diagram or a flow chart, which can be useful. Um, that's clearly uh, copied from somewhere because it's not very useful, but it tells you how to make a diagram. Um, and, oh, here we go. Right. Yeah, cool. So you can add steps in quite easily if I just go here and say nope why did that not there we go yeah so you can yeah as you can see it's code um, that can render into a diagram and then those diagrams can be exported as images or embedded into uh, markdown files. So this was probably something else that I wanted to show is, um, although there's a subtle difference between the, this file, which is a UML, plant UML file that starts with start UML and goes straight into the diagram. This one is a markdown file. And so I can, you know, I can put titles, And whatnot there, and then render. So okay, so yeah, you can add markdown and your diagrams. I don't have this set up properly with Plant UML to render in a markdown when I'm not connected to the internet. Uh, but yeah, so you can mix and match markdown and diagrams using that approach. So how I think I've got a couple more minutes. Anyone? Anyone? No one's kicking me off. Is anyone going to kick me off? You, you can go another couple of minutes. All right, I'll give one more quick demo. Thanks. <laughs> um, so this here is an example of a folder of Markdown files, which uh, so here, this is my repo. It's got Make, so this is using MakeDocs, that Python tool that I talked about. So you basically go into the folder, you create a folder called Docs, you put all your Markdown stuff in there, structure it whatever way you want. Um, you can do links between files like you would in normal Markdown, like GitHub Markdown. Um, and then you go into that fold, the folder above Docs and you do MakeDocs in it, or MakeDocs new, and it creates this file. Um, and it can render plant UML inline. Uh, there's a, a million plugins to do fancy things, but basically it's taken this messy structure of folders that I created, uh, it was documentation for a project, and it rendered them to this. Um, now the disclaimer is that if I had known I was gonna use this for make docs, I would probably have changed the titles of some um, documents and things, but you can override those to make it a bit more usable. Um, it's a static site, so I can actually search for things. Um, it renders, I'd somehow using JavaScript, it renders a search thing. Um, what's in here? Hardware? No. Products? There we go. So I found something. It had the word product in it. Um, so yeah, which is pretty handy if you want to be able to do, without running a web server, it's, remember it's a static, totally static site. You can host it on like Azure um, static sites or the S3 bucket or whatever you want. Um, so that's pretty cool. However, it looks kind of rubbish. Um, so you can add a theme to it. Um, and yep, if you add a theme while the thing's running, it crashes. <laughs> but if I now refresh this page, looks a bit better. Uh, looks nicer, looks more material. And then there's a heap of plugins for material UI. Uh, or for material make docs that let you do 
fancy things like um, nice fancier lists or code, uh, code formatting and all that sort of stuff. You can embed, um, oh, there we go. You can embed C4 diagrams straight into your markdown. Um, and so now you've got uh, what was a bunch of markdown files in a repo as a self-hosted documentation website that you could have pushed out of your repo or repos into somewhere that can be accessed by non-developers as well. So that is uh, the final demo. <laughs> Any questions or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Do I do I find that I take the like the diagramming code or or yeah, whatever? Yeah. 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 So like the diagramming code. Like, yeah. Um, and then convert it into pseudo code or whatever to then put it into the code base and actually write code. Yeah. Or just copy and paste it. I'm just, yeah. I'm just curious. No. No. I like I haven't done that. Um, it's possible you could. What I have done though is kind of gone the other way where I took code, like I used reflection in .NET and created output to a diagram format, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but I don't know if it was. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's just, co it's, um, it's just text, so if you found value in doing that, you totally could. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you could also, uh, what was the statement? Uh, yeah, Markdown, yeah, you can, well, I guess once it's in Markdown, yeah, you can trans transpile or render it to almost anything. Um, yep. Thank you, Shaw. Cool, thank you. Um, take five minutes, use the bathroom, grab oh. some more food. What about, hang on, just a minute. One thing, I forgot, so, uh, Thanks to JetBrains, uh, which I mentioned a few times through my talk, um, <laughs> we have one of these to give away. So it's a discount code for any individual JetBrains product. Um, I feel like you asked some good questions. Okay, you. Do you have all the JetBrains products though? I've never had a JetBrains product. Oh, perfect. Well, you do now. There you go. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. If I feel you ask like... more questions later, you may have two products. <laughs> <laughs> Take five minutes, use the bathroom, get some food, we'll let Andrew get set up and then